Should a sermon always be positive? Well, it should always head in that direction. But if it's always only saying smooth things. Should a sermon be sarcastic, taunting? More difficult question. Habakkuk's message today would certainly raise eyebrows in much of the contemporary church and attract criticism at the door. Let alone the criticism of the world outside. Because what happens here is we're presented in Habakkuk chapter 2 from verse 6 through to verse 20 with a set of, well it says woe in the NIV, that's not what it says. It is a taunt song, and it uses the language of taunting. This is an ancient Near Eastern taunt song in format, and it's, it's again, it's hugely cleverly crafted. It's a tremendous bit of poetic taunting. Taunting of Babylon in its defeat. But first comes the defeat of Judah by Babylon. You see, and then there's that, there's that gap and they have to wait for this to be realised. So verses 6 to 19 contain a prophecy. And that prophecy is in the form of a taunt song. You know what a taunt song is? The Hebrew word here, mashal, begins as there are three words used to describe this taunting. And there's lots of the language of taunting included in the text itself. You don't get that in the translation. You certainly don't get it in the NIV. As if somebody somewhere was ashamed of a taunt song in Scripture. There are taunt songs in Scripture. But the word that's used to start off here is the word mashal. And mashal is the word that the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, used to translate a parable, a proverb, an epithet, a saying. Here a taunt song. Will not all of these take up a taunt song against him, it says, even mockery and insinuations against him, and say, woe to him who increases what is not his. It's a taunt song. And a taunt song is what victors, or those who want to be victors, use to rub the noses of the vanquished in the dirt, or, or to psych up the troops before the battle. The prophecy consists of a series of five, what the NIV calls, woes. Five taunts. And the subject matter is a punishment that God is going to bring down on those who afflict Judah and afflict them severely, successfully, you think. So we looked last time in Habakkuk chapter 2 at the silence of the prophet in verse 1. He says, I've said too much, I've been up on the battlements, up on the ramparts, and I've listened. And then comes the commission to the prophet. To, to write down this oracle in stone, it's going to stand, it's going to be lasting and run with it. And then there's the observation on the nature of the situation, the sins of the people and so on and so on in verses 4 to 5. And now we're coming straight into this taunt song that accompanies the victory of the vindication of, of God's faithful people over their coming captives. A taunt song. The actual woes themselves uh, relate closely to, to the sins against Judah that, that are going to be committed by the invading Babylonians. Um, it's not a matter of sheer tribalism. It's not a matter of we're us and you're that and you're inferior because you're that and we're this and we're better than you are. It's not a matter of tribalism. And that's usually the way we've taught songs, isn't it? Where we encounter taught songs. I suppose we encounter them in sport, we encounter them. And there are some quite elaborate ones worked out there these days. There have been some pretty bad ones in the news recently um, against Manchester United. It was funny about the Munich air crash in 1958 and all that stuff. Pretty grim. Uh, they can be like that. They're tribal. Tribal and nasty. Mm -hmm. Now this one isn't tribal. This one is ethical. And it's spiritual. When did you hear an ethical talk song? <laughs> As if you say, yeah, you like a bunch of sinners. You know, no, no, not quite like that. Um, you this, that, or the other, whatever it is the sin is. Well, that's what you've got here. You've got an ethical taunt song. Because it's, it's 
from the people of the ethical God, the people of ethical monotheism. Usually they're tribal, this one is ethical, quite unusual. But, but there's more to it than that. God had declared to Israel, Deuteronomy 28, 37, that if they did not keep the commands of God, they would become the object of taunts amongst the nations. And that's what's going to happen with the, with the Babylonians coming. And now the Lord in Habakkuk 2 is revealing that beyond that, once that bitter experience is coming upon them for their sin and the purging of their sin and the set up what God's doing for the future, the day is nonetheless coming when all the nations that these Babylonians have captured will taunt their conquerors in song. Let's have a look at it. The five woes of Habakkuk 2. The first woe has to do with theft and extortion. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods, makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? That could have come from the pages of the Daily Mail, couldn't it? Or some other suitable newspaper, The Guardian and the Independent. Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you'll become their prey. Because you've plundered many nations. The peoples that are left will plunder you. You've shed human blood, you've destroyed, destroyed lands and cities, everyone in them. This is to do with theft and extortion. Now, we said woe, and it is, it is really not a great translation. It's not the best translation to use woe. It's an onomatopoeic word in Hebrew. It's hey! It's hey! It's, 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 a, it's a verbal poke in the eye. Hey! What's more? What is this mocking language, mocking? Piling up stolen goods. See, what you've got here is an ethical taunt. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's weird. It, it, it's a vindication of the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal. And here's the thinking behind it. And there's, there's analysis, there's thinking behind it. If you steal, who is your creditor? Who do you owe? You're in debt if you're a thief. You're a person in debt to others, the thinking goes, because you haven't earned what you have. You haven't come by that money the way God has ordained that a man or a woman should come by money by earning it. You haven't earned what you have. So again, to whom in that circumstance are you in debt? Who have you had your wealth from? Who then are your creditors? The people you did not earn it of, but nonetheless had it from. Your victims are your creditors. That's a new way to see things. And this scripture is saying, in the providence of God, they will suddenly arise. Suddenly. How long? How long must this go on, verse 6? That, that was the chant of chapter 1, wasn't it? How long? How long? And God was saying, oh, the judgment's coming quickly. Now the redemption, the, the vindication, and so on, is coming. It will come and not tarry, but it will come at its own time. And it won't come with a great deal of running to that. It will come suddenly. The judgment will come suddenly, the deliverance comes suddenly. These predators will suddenly arise, and people think that everything's carrying on the way it's always carried on, and all of a sudden, God acts. The way it goes. You've been told already. You've been told already. I'll tell you once. I had to say that to a couple of kids in assembly this week. In, in, School on Wednesday morning, I'd say, now, come up, you guys, you know, I'll tell you something, I'll tell you something. Right. Then it happens, or other things happen to you. you must be sensible. Uh, you know, you could equally say to our age, to the mature people, uh, mature people of this age and generation, guys, God has spoken to us, he said it once, he's not going to say it again. Why should he? Do you know this name? Suddenly. <laughs> Will not your creditors suddenly arise? So, it's all about reciprocity in God's judgment on sin. It's all about retribution, just deserts. Just deserts are coming. The way even of these executioners that God has appointed to do all this stuff, they're coming their way. It's the just deserts that's coming to these people who are coming in to judge Judah. And it's coming to them because they're not doing it for the glory of God, they're doing it for their own glory. <coughs> and therefore what they're doing is sin. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods, your creditors will suddenly arise. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gains, the next world, verse 9. 
and it's taunt. Hey! Poke in the eye. Building your house by unjust gain. Setting his nest on high is a fun expression. To escape the clutches of ruin, you plotted the ruin of many people, shame your house, folk in your life. The stones of the wall will cry out. And the beams of the woodwork will echo. How about that, it? Babylonians are coming. They're going to carry captives to Babylon to build those hanging gardens. And hundreds of other self-glorifying edifices. And they're going to take all the wealth of the nations that they conquered along to finance it all. Building their house by unjust gain. It hasn't glorified your house, says Habakkuk. It's shamed it. It's not yours, you didn't do that, you nicked it. Ah oh, yes, those hanging gardens of Babylon, still listed as one of the seven wonders of the world. The place in scripture appears to be, be a bit of a wonder, it is a wonder, but what is it, is it that we ought to be wondering at when you look at a thing like that, those hanging gardens? What, what should we be wondering at? Scripture seems to lead us to think we should be wondering at, at the way that they were built, unjustly built. Sta an edifice that stands as the monument to, to where building in defiance of God gets you. The edifice stands there today. An edifice that stands as a testimony to where building in defiance of God gets you. How is that? It's empty. The edifice stands there today. Elaborate and empty. That's what building in defiance of God gets you. Third poke in the eye. In taunt. Walk to him who builds a city with bloodshed, establishes a town by injustice. See the futility of human endeavours built on bloodshed. That's what he's getting at here. How many great man-made empires built on human cruelty and human endeavour need to rise and fall before people get this message. Vanity. Building a city with bloodshed, establishing a town by injustice. What sort of foundation for a place is that? Has not the Lord Almighty determined the people's labour is only fuel for the fire that will make it roar more? The nations ex exhaust themselves for nothing, but the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. The Lord has the waters covered. See, just as Habakkuk and, and the inspiration of God looks at the tremendous building of Babylon and he says, the stones of the wall are going to cry out. You remember Jesus walking through the temple. You know, his disciples were wondering at this building. Three days you might get down and build it again. Jesus to the Jewish leaders. Yeah, even these walls will cry. Here again, emphasizing again, you build the city with bloodshed. What's that saying? And Jesus uses that against the Jewish leaders. You build a city with bloodshed, and here's where it comes to it comes to nothing because the earth is going to be filled with the glory, knowledge of the glory of the Lord. That wind up day as the waters cover the sea, where will it get to then? All this transient human glory. Where's it going? Where's it getting you? To vanity. Because at the end of the day, the glory that is Athens and Carthage and Rome, Constantinople, Swansea, you know, Copperopolis, right? It's going to be brought down. Shown up for what it is as God's kingdom is established on earth, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters. What do you make of this next one? Verse 15. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbours. Now is this, is this a, a, a fearful indictment of most people's Christmas practice perhaps? You know, a bottle of wine for the neighbours? It's not, it's not. Pouring it from the wine skin till they are drunk so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. Huh? What's this about? Drunkenness, coarseness, sexual exploitation with drink. Babylon mixes an irrational, exploitative 
wrath with the wine that it calls out and explodes people. I mean, it's the way that part of the depravity that's inherent in sin is, is that sin insists on involving others in its own debauchery. Have you come across that sort of thing? Um, God's, God's faithful people being pressured to join in with the sins of others. You know? Sin left rampant tries to bring others in on it. And God's people are going to be ready to stand up and be strong and stand apart from that when, when depraved people try and suck you in. Babylon is not satisfied with getting drunk itself. It rests content only when it's forced its degradation onto others. Because this doesn't, this doesn't glorify human nature. This doesn't distinguish human nature. This debases it. Incidentally, so we notice the intimate connection that does seem to exist between drunkenness and sexual impurity. There it is. Verse 15. Verse 16. Lot's daughters got him drunk so that they could commit their shameful act of incest, Genesis 19, 32-5. Noah became drunk, but one of his sons mishandled the situation, leading to this exposure of Noah's, Noah's nakedness, Genesis 9, 21. We'll come back to that. Let's come to it now. This exposure of nakedness in the NIV, it, tra it translates here, gaze on their naked bodies. It's a circumlocution for more than looking. In Leviticus 20, Elsewhere, it clearly refers to having sexual relations with somebody. So, it appears very much from the context of the rest of Scripture that Babylon, perhaps like the pubs of Swansea and Llanelli, is well up for slipping somebody a Mickey Finn in order to exploit that person sexually. That's the idea of Habakkuk's conveying there. And now it's going to be their turn, and they will have to drink to the dregs, the cup of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and as Babylon has treated others, God is going to bring it back on them. It's your turn, verse 16. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming round to you. And disgrace will cover your glory. It's an idea that gets picked up elsewhere in Scripture. The cup the Lord must drink as he bears sin. In the garden of his son, Lord let this cup He's going to bear sin. Well, here's the cup. Of God's wrath. Here's where, here's where it's coming from in Habakkuk. Then in Revelation, Revelation picks it up big time. Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said in a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Where's that idea come from? Habakkuk oh, 2. A third angel followed and said in a loud voice, voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength. And this, this making others drink to their shame is going to be turned back on Babylon. And drinking herself will lead to Babylon's own being brought to shame. Revelation 17, the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. And there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. And she held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. And the name written on her forehead was a mystery, Babylon the Great. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. And it all picks up on that experience back there with the Babylonian Conquest and reactivity of the The next taunt gets to the heart of the matter. 
The next one gets to the big issue that underlies all of Babylon's excesses. Verse 18, Habakkuk chapter 2. Of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman? Hang on, hang on. We've been dealing with ethical issues. We've been dealing with ethical courts. What's this? Where's this coming from here? Here's the heart of the matter. They are given over to idolatry. And this is the fruit. Of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life. Or the lifeless stone, wake up. What, what use is that? Can it give you guidance? It's covered with gold and silver. It can't move its mouth. There's no breath in it to be speaking with. It's a dead thing. It's a created thing, not the creator of God. Yes, the wicked do terrible things and will do dreadful things shortly, but over a prolonged period, they will work out these, these, these acts of idolatry in terms of ethical behaviour against the people, against Judah. They'll do it as instruments of God's judgment, but those human beings who do this will nonetheless be held responsible and accountable for what they do. They'll face the just penalty for their offences. What's their offence? Idolatry at root. Idolatry at and when they pay the penalty for that, that in which they trusted will openly prove to be as worthless as it always was. Again, the tables are turned. See, they have taunted Judah, Judah in defeat, with the impotence of her God. God says, we'll see. They will have taunted Judah with the, the, the power and the wonder and the splendor and the prettiness of their idols that have given them this victory in God. It is their idolatry, their worshipping created things rather than the creator God that has led Babylon to the bad behaviour she's embraced and therefore, in the hands of a just, personal God who she denies, she got into the trouble she's in. And all this is prophesied of Babylon before it ever happens. And all this rapidly, subsequently happened. So, why do so many make the same error today? Why is there this idolatry? Why is it everywhere? And why do people then go on about the, the, how terrible the world is and still continue in their idolatry? Does that make sense? Why do so many make this same mistake today? No, no, no. Not so many of them are dancing around statues or bushes alone. It happens. But their cars, their caravans, their kitchen units. Might as well be dancing around. those things take the place of God in life. And they're idolised. People are worshipping created things rather than the created God. And above all forever praise. The same problem you've got in Romans 1. And what does Paul say in Romans 1 is the consequence of that idolatry, the consequence of that action. What is God's judgment on that? What's being called but it's not. light of the outworking in history of this prophecy from God, listen, here comes the voice, the clear voice of consummate wisdom. Be quiet. So many voices shouting for so many things that are hostile to God. Be quiet. Verse 20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Be quiet. See, Habakkuk, being a faithful guy, has poured out all his words and, and, and so on in chapter 1. And then at the beginning of chapter 2, he's got the sense to get up on the back and show it. I've, I've spoken, I've spoken too much. I will get on the back and I'll just wait and see what God's going to say about this. That's the response of faith. All this other stuff is the response of idolatry. And it keeps on making that which is right wrong and that which is wrong right. Honouring its idols. Habakkuk has just described the idols of the nations as speechless nothings, but God is in his holy temple. At the centre of his appropriate worship, seated upon his symbolic throne, it's time for the babblers and noisy chatterers to be silent, to be silent before their actual God. Be 
Because they choose a subject that's definitely coming. This is definitely coming. It may seem to be a long time coming, but it will not delay. It awaits only its God appointed time. It will come and it will not delay. So, let all the earth be silent before him. All these expressions that are holier than God, cleverer than God. sits on his throne. Conclusion. Whatever way you look at it, this is the way it worked out in history, in the end, life is certainly going to be a bit of a battle for the people of Judah, the rebellious people of God, isn't it? That happens. Well, how do we deal? How do we handle the rebellious people of God? They get themselves in a terrible state. You know, those who rebel against God's way and before and, and you think, well, too often they're just written off and they have to go away. People hurt themselves in their sin. That's surely the lesson of this book, isn't it? People in their own sin, by the virtue of their own choices, they hurt themselves. How do we, how do we help that? Life is certainly going to be tough for these people of Judah. But God has got a very firm grip on the alarming, apparently out of control things that are going to happen to them because of their choices. And he's controlling them, not just in judgment, but also, as we've seen before, in order longer term to bring about redemption for the people of God. The monarchy's going to go and the kingdom of God's going to come in. God's still got a purpose in this. Yes, they've rebelled and it looks ugly. Yes, they've rebelled and they hurt themselves. God has not given up on his purpose. Would of course be the sort of short term, this worldly quick fix that humanity loves to hear about so very much but the eternal salvation of the people of God that justified shall live by faith as we saw last time and the people of Judah have brought so much of all this bad stuff on themselves, of course they have but the battle they brought themselves must be gone through and the consequences of sin must be borne says Habakkuk by that faithful And in that battle or struggle, as in any battle or struggle, morale still needs to be attended to, even in those who are in trouble because of their sinfulness. God is doing that in Habakkuk chapter 2. He's taking care of their morale, even though they're facing his judgment, because of their own choice of sin. God is still taking care of their morale. That's what this taunt song is about. How gracious is that? As if God is attending to and providing for the morale of the very people whose sins have brought down his righteous, utterly judge, justified judgment against them, which they're going to feel the penalty of, he's going to look after their morale because he wants them to live by faith. <coughs> of course, and, and this is helpful and encouraging, of course, God is going to make sure that nobody gets away with anything. And the afflicted need to know that. And he's making that clear that these afflicted people in Habakkuk do. People are accountable to God whether they acknowledge him or not. But if you look at this prophetic taunt song, you'll notice it completely unlike any battlefield or sporting taunt song you're ever going to come across. It's not tribal, it's ethical. It's come on, you can come back here. Tribal, you can do nothing about it. You are that tribal, you're not that tribal. There's no hope. Ethical, there's hope. And it almost fulfills the pastoral role of worship. Now worship is, of course, primarily about bringing glory to God. The private manifestation of God's perfection is His holiness. The public manifestation of His perfection is His glory. And that public manifestation commands worship. That's primarily how it works. But there's a pastoral role for worship too. It does something good for us to worship God. That worship performs a pastoral role in that it brings our worldview back in line with reality. 
It reinforces that worldview in a spiritually healthy and wholesome outlook. Worship affects all of that. It gives you an approach to the hard experiences of daily life that you're going to need. There's a pastoral role to worship too. It helps you in that way. It reforms your thinking. That's what I mean by the pastoral role of worship. It enables us to embrace and take hold of the worldview that our Bible teaching informs us of. It's all very well to get informed a bit, but then you've got to get in. Worship is doing that. That's part of its pastoral role. Now, worship is not a taunt song, but it performs a similar pastoral role to the taunt song here in Habakkuk 2, which is there to readjust the worldview of the people of Judah in their, well, as they headed to a period of hard experience, to readjust it to the actual realities, to help them keep hold of that as they're dealing with the downtroddenness that's coming their way. Going through that hard and bitter experience, it'll either turn individuals away from their God or towards Him. And this taunt song is there to help them, to guard their morale and their outlook in times of great suffering and great difficulty. It's a poke in the eye for godlessness. Here's where it all becomes important, pastorally important, in making us resilient, persevering in faith through difficulty. Not rejoicing that the demons and their allies are subject to us, but rejoicing that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life and evil will not triumph over the Lord. And in all of this, in all of this worship, in all of this taunt song, in all of it, it is God who delivers his people. It is he who does it. That's unlike any taunt song I know as well. It is God who sets his people free from the effects of his righteous judgment on them and brings about the plan of salvation that leads through this veil of tears and hard experience because of the choices we've made into the eternal and the glorious presence of God. And Habakkuk is attending to the morale of those who brought it on themselves to get them through so that the righteous might live by their faith. What an interesting book this is. Unexpected, unusual, can't tell you, I, I, I fail, my understanding of the Hebrew fails, but the, the art and the artist here. There's nothing wrong with art with God, is there? But wow, look what God is doing. As he cares for his 